to the Koto Pator. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Dean Nodding. I'm one of the directors of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law. Um, and today's public address is very much a treat, a special treat, as we're joined by a familiar face and a great friend, the Honourable Justice Matthew Palmer. Today he'll speak to us about his current position as a judge of the High Court. But we also uh, know him from the previous positions he, ha he has held including as former Dean of this faculty. Uh, we are employing me as, um, as a lecturer, I think was one of the most, ins most inspired <laughs> <laughs> I can say. Uh, he's also a former director of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law, so welcome home again. Uh, but Matthew, uh, Justice Palmer has also served as a, a Treasury official, Deputy Solicitor General, Barrister and Queen's Counsel. And in those roles, public law has been a thread that has woven through Justice Palmer's service. Uh, a commitment to good governance and constitutional values, a deep appreciation of the complexity and nuance of the government apparatus, especially when viewed through the eyes of a public law realist, attentive to the cultural and socio-legal dimensions beyond the mere formal structures and rules. Now, I won't recount the full list of scholarship developments and, and, and cases that bear Justice Palmer's fingerprints, because that'll eat until it's, it's time, and there are many. I expect, except to note his fine book exploring the law and practice of the Treaty of Waitangi and New Zealand's Constitution and Government, and to quip that the public law students are this very week grappling with his provocative taxonomy of constitutional sources, so welcome to those students that are in the audience too. Um, since his elevation to the bench in October 2015, uh, Justice Palmer has continued to exhibit his character and strength as a deep thinker on uh, public law matters, and administrative law scholars are particularly intrigued by his industry in seeking to reshape uh, judicial review principle and doctrine in a number of fascinating cases, but I'll leave Justice Palmer to reflect perhaps on the role of a judge as reformer. And he'll speak for around about 40 minutes and there'll hopefully be an opportunity for questions at the end. So if you can, please join with me in welcoming Justice Palmer. Thank you, Dean. Tell the Chief Justice, uh, but since my appointment, I've been keeping a diary about my impressions of life and law on the High Court bench, or judgery, to use her phrase. And I drew on this in giving a lecture entitled The Judiciary and the Legal Academy in Hong Kong in 2016. My starting point was a quote uh, from Richard Posner in his 2016 book. Uh, on the Judiciary and the Academy of Divergent Paths. Uh, Justice Glazebrook has since considered that book in more depth in relation to the New Zealand Supreme Court, but Justice Judge Posner said, judges have had roughly 2,000 years of experience in trying with considerable success to awe the laity, project a self-congratulatory aura, conceal their failures and inadequacies. As an insider, this is him. As an insider, <laughs> I know how to pull back the curtain, and I think it will actually help the institution for me to do so. Judge Posner wrote that book after 36 years as a judge in the United States Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which followed a full time career as law professor at the University of Chicago. And my experience is much less fulsome. But I have found that comparing my experience of the judiciary and the academy uh, has been thought-provoking, at least for me. Today, I share some of my thoughts uh, with the New Zealand audience and throw in uh, a few comparisons to the legal profession for good measure. I do so with some apprehension as, looking around the room, my audience appears to be primarily drawn uh, from the roles which I am talking about. Uh, I welcome your academic critiques, uh, your professional submissions, and uh, any appellate overrulings which come my way. <laughs> but before I start properly, 
Uh, I should note one factor which complicates my observations, which are, after all, based on my personal experience of the institutions uh, which I examine. My career has jumped around a fair bit, from the public service to academia, to the legal profession and government, to the bar, and then to the bench. And when I jumped from the bar to the bench, I also jumped from Wellington to Auckland. The then Attorney General told me I had a choice about that, although I'm not entirely sure he and the Chief Justice shared the same view about whose call that was. Despite my 12-year-old daughter saying at the time that I had ruined her life forever, <laughs> I thought being exposed to Auckland uh, would be good for my continuing legal education. I said in my swearing in, I was not sure that it is now possible to understand New Zealand and therefore New Zealand law without understanding Auckland. Now, I am sure it is not possible. In this respect, at least, Auckland has exceeded my expectations, as it has my daughters, who now appears to be happy to have become an Auckland teenager, though not just another Aucklander. <laughs> Compared to Wellington, there is less engagement between the bench and the profession uh, and the legal academy in Auckland. At neither Auckland Law School do you find the number or, or diversity of attendees at a public lecture that you do today, uh, even given the better weather. I applaud and encourage uh, the Dean and the faculty here for continuing to maintain Victoria's level of and quality of external engagement. We find in this meeting place perspectives about uh, the role and the nature of law, which can only benefit from being exposed to other perspectives about the same things, about other perspectives and other ideas. In general, in fact, I, I have found uh, that there is less interest in ideas, let alone politics or policy in Auckland, than in Wellington, whether on the sidelines of children's cricket or netball or at dinner parties uh, or even in the academic lecture theatre or the courtroom. There is, however, more interest in business and property uh, and traffic. <laughs> the relative lack of interest in policy in the Auckland courtroom may be related to what I perceive to be a longer tail in the Auckland legal profession than in Wellington. And I do note that I intend to give this lecture in Auckland. I just thought I'd try it out first. <laughs> <laughs> in my view, the Auckland legal profession is more diverse in terms of proficiency. <laughs> as, well as, as well as ethnicity, and those two variables are not related. It suffers from less coherence uh, and benefits from that as well. In my experience, Auckland Council rarely talk to each other before a hearing, even to on about how to divide their time, let alone the legal issues at stake. They will likely practice in entirely different villages called suburbs in Auckland. They may well not know each other and are, in my view, relatively more prone to argue every point, including points that do not matter, though, of course, no lawyer is immune from that temptation. So I think that the relative lack of assumed social norms makes litigation less efficient in Auckland than in Wellington. The same aspect may make it less cosy and intimate, which can be a good thing, good thing if norms in a legal profession are not healthy. My impression is that the nature of the court's caseload in Auckland is different from Wellington, 15% of my 188 judgments so far is centred on public law issues, which is higher than I was expecting, but I suspect the proportion is higher here. Uh, interestingly, the statistics suggest that there is a similar proportion of judicial reviews, though, which is not the same as public law. Certainly there is a higher proportion of criminal cases in Auckland. Uh, in the year to June 2017, 18% of the new business of the Auckland High Court Registry was made up of criminal trials and appeals, compared to 10% in Wellington. 
I also suspect the relatively more commercial cases uh, in Auckland, uh, that's an impression. Speaking for myself, 40% of my cases to date have been criminal, 60% civil, 24% have centred on commercial property trust or common law issues. I had not realised before living in Auckland just how different these two cities are in their populations, their publics, their cultures, and of course that shows up in the business before the courts. Of the four juries I've empanelled in Auckland, only one has had a Pākehā majority. The juries in Hamilton and Rotorua have looked quite different. Of the 188 judgments I've issued so far, 44% of the 263 litigants whose ethnicity I could determine with reasonable confidence have been Pākehā. 14% have been Māori. 10% have been Pacifica. 13% have been Chinese. And 14, another 14% have been other Southeast Asian and Indian. I do not have equivalent numbers for Wellington, but I suspect they are different. And these differences show up in terms of cultural attitudes. I've been struck by how often first-generation Chinese litigants are in court with each other over matters which most Pākehā or Māori would settle without reaching court. Lawyers may contribute to that. Perhaps there are cultural factors at play, I don't know. And as far as I can tell, there appear to be different cultural views of what it means to tell the truth how binding the law is, and whether court orders need to be strictly followed or not. You'll understand these are somewhat adventurous, uh, impressionistic observations about culture. Auckland and Wellington are not as different from one another as New, New Zealand is from the United States, but the appreciable differences that do exist make me wonder just what New Zealand's culture is and will be and which city's culture is closer to that future culture, and which is the more provincial. I think the New Zealand legal system, including the profession, the academy, and the judiciary, needs to give some conscious thought to the implications of the increasing cultural diversity uh, of New Zealand. I turn now to some comparisons between the judiciary uh, and the legal academy and the profession. It's difficult to assess whether Judge Posner was less complimentary of the judiciary or the academy in his book before enumerating 26 deficiencies in the United States federal judiciary over two chapters. He said, I had taken too much for granted. I had missed a certain staleness in the current judicial culture, a tendency of judges to recite propositions of doubtful veracity just because they had been repeated before. A lack of curiosity and imagination, a lack of clarity and candor and a weak sense of fact. On the other hand, Posner was critical of academics. He said rewards, status, prestige, not necessarily money, in academic law go to doctrinalists and theoreticians who write for each other on a plane of discourse inaccessible or unhelpful to judges. Now, America, as Donald Trump seems determined to demonstrate, is different. A number of the tendencies posed in laments in the US scholarship and ju uh, judgery are absent in New Zealand. The dominance of judicial clerks, the dominance of student-edited law reviews, the theoretical bent of much US legal scholarship, and the lack of interaction between the judiciary <coughs> and the academy. And I think Judge Posner's uh, underlying assumption that a key role of the legal academy is to help the judiciary cope with their own systemic difficulties is misplaced, although I have seen this year at least one Australian academic disagrees with me. Personally, I would prefer the academy engage in research and scholarship into legal issues that matter in New to New Zealand society, economy, economy, culture, and teach law students how to think about those legal issues in context. And in New Zealand's legal system today, that requires more focus uh, on Parliament and the executive uh, than on the judiciary. If anything, 
I think the way law is taught in New Zealand generally is too oriented to case law. Of course, it's important for students to be taught how to read cases and to appreciate how judges make decisions. But my experience is that New Zealand law graduates understand that at the expense of understanding the relationship between law and policy and how legislation and executive decisions are made in reality. I do consider milder versions of some of Judge Posner's uh, identified tendencies in the United States can be detected here. And I think his primary general point applies to New Zealand. I think there is a gulf of understanding and interests between the legal academy and the judiciary, and I suspect it is growing. More mutual understanding between and interest in what each other is and does, I think, would be desirable in the separate interests of each. Now, in what follows, I offer impressions, not of individual academics and judges. For some of the people in the room, that would be tempting. <laughs> but first of who they are, and second, what they do. I suggest there are more similarities between legal academics, judges, and practitioners than differences. Most importantly, they all have law degrees. And as any student or graduate of Victoria Law School will know, having a law degree means you can think like a lawyer, which is not a cultural attribute to be underestimated. I've written uh, in a couple of articles about the importance of disciplinary training and experience in shaping the different outlook, world view, culture, or language in which each branch of government speaks. And I've characterized the judiciary as speaking the language of the common law. But there are differences in how lawyers, judges, and academics speak this language. The working lives of lawyers and judges are dominated by the common law method of examining one case after another. And that is the emphasis of a bachelor's degree in law. Graduates deg graduate degrees, uh, particularly doctorates, tend to take you into other disciplinary realms and into broader perspectives on the normative values that should be in law, into policy. Every legal academic in New Zealand has a law degree and almost all now have postgraduate law degrees. We have departed from the old English tradition of not requiring law practitioners to have a law degree. We have not yet reached the American position where some academics, including my former doctoral supervisor at Yale, uh, does not have a law degree. But the international market for academics in law, as in other disciplines, increasingly demands academics either have or get a doctorate mostly now from overseas. At Victoria University, uh, your website uh, indicates that 20 of the 35 faculty members have doctorates and 15 have master's degrees. The doctorates are from the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, and Germany in that order of frequency. Accordingly, it's not now uncommon for junior academics to be recruited at or towards the end uh, of their studies with no or little experience or interest in legal practice. This is a far cry from the days a generation uh, or two ago when most faculty members practice law as well. More New Zealand academics do have experience of the practice of law than in elite US law schools, and a few have had distinguished careers in practice before meeting at, moving to academia, and I'm looking in particular at Campbell McLaughlin. Uh, others, such as uh, John Preble and uh, Richard Boast, um, and all three of those uh, gentlemen have the initials QC after their name, have developed and maintained expert legal practices in their specialty areas while academics. But overall, uh, my view is that the New Zealand Legal Academy has less experience of legal practice than it used to, and that is increasing. I suspect some of the disconnect between academia and the judiciary lies in the difference between law and policy about which I've written elsewhere. In general, the judiciary must focus on what law is and academics on what it should be. But, as we know, 
most judgments, many of them in the senior appellate courts make law. And I suggest it's no coincidence that the senior appellate courts, which take broader judicial views of the coherence and consistency of law and the policy underlying it, have the most interest in academic scholarship. This is reflected in the ratios of postgraduate degrees at the different levels of the senior court benches. More judges have postgraduate law degrees than do most practitioners, and the proportion increases through the hierarchy. Two of the current five current Supreme Court judges have doctorates, two have master's degrees. Five of the ten Court of Appeal judges have masters, another was a rogue scholar. Of the 46 High Court judges and associate judges, 17 have master's degrees and four have doctorates. One of the effects of the different ages and stages of the judicial and academic career paths in New Zealand is that each has a markedly different age profile. I haven't got our statistics on this, but my personal experience is a case in point. At 53, I am one of the youngest half dozen or so High Court judges. At Victoria University, if, if I was still there, I would be amongst the oldest 10 or so of the 35 academics currently on the faculty. Uh, needless to say, different generations have different perspectives of issues, uh, something judges may wish to remember. The difference in respective career paths also accounts for a difference in how well off judges and academics uh, are financially. Both groups have given up the filthy lure of lucre in private practice, as they will tell you. But judges are paid much better than academics, and because most of them have already spent most of their careers in significantly better paid private practice, they are much better off than academics. I haven't thought carefully enough uh, about all the implications of that. Perhaps the academics here will. One of the work of academics, lawyers and judges, surprisingly, at least to me, I have found being a judge more similar to being an academic than being, the, than being a law practitioner. The two main parts of an academic's job, teaching and research. There are two equivalent parts to a judge's job, hearings and writing judgments. I will spend some time exploring each of those uh, but first, I should say something about workload. Academics, judges, and lawyers all work hard, as I'm sure you will all agree, at least in relation to the group of which you remember. But my experience is they all have different views on how hard each other works. <laughs> this is dangerous territory, and you'll understand uh, that my views are simply impressions based on my personal experience at different stages uh, of my own career, may not be yours, uh, and there are different dimensions to what hard work is. Number of hours, or intensity and complexity, or pressure and stress. My experience is that high court judges work very hard. I made a list of all the things I dealt with during one, just one, week of being a judge and duty, as the duty judge in Auckland in 2016. The areas of law involved commercial proceedings between a finance company and its debenture trustee, custody of children, termination of trust, a bail appeal for a burglar, setting aside a disposition of property, a commercial dispute under arbitration, drug dealing, criminal charges, defamation, patent infringement, severe commercial relationship difficulties between fruit and vegetable business owners, a body corporate arrangement proposal, restraining orders over the proceeds of crime, confidentiality orders, a dispute between neighbours over a driveway, a dispute over a caveat preventing sale of a multi-million dollar property, access by the media to a court file regarding copyright infringement, taking a guilty plea for grievous bodily harm, granting bail or not for an alleged murderer, granting a bail variation for an alleged kidnapper, a bail appeal for assault and a bail appeal for drugs. Much of the work was procedural. List court hearings, setting down substantive hearings, making orders about timetabling. But other work was substantive. A duty week in Auckland usually involves uh, three civil list hearings where 10 to 30 files are called in an hour or so for procedural directions to be made. It usually involves an arraignment where 
guilty plea is taken, uh, or a sentencing or two. Several bail or sentence or conviction appeals and one or two, one or two, one hour or two hour hearings into something which may be quite straightforward or quite complex and which usually require reserved decisions. You usually get one duty week per quarter and one dedicated week a quarter to write judgments. Additional judgment time is also usually allocated after a lengthy civil hearing, and it also arises on an ad hoc basis uh, when cases are settled or trial is resolved. Otherwise, each week is allocated to either civil or criminal hearings, with a short cause or of half a day to, a, to, do, to two days, uh, or longer trials of one to ten weeks. And those hearing weeks include eight to ten weeks out of town on circuit each year. The Auckland circuit involves tra travel to Pamaray, uh, Tauranga, Hamilton and Rotorua. In two years and five months sitting as a judge, I have delivered 188 judgments. It's around three and a half judgments a month, uh, almost one a week. I've not kept track of the much greater number of minutes and bench notes. Those numbers vary over time, of course. Uh, can't issue as many judges, judgments in a long trial uh, when uh, you've got other things to think about. Uh, in, in the course of an 11 week uh, trial, um, a manslaughter and kidnapping jury trial last year, I found I had time to issue only one substantive judgment uh, and two judgments on leave to appeal and two cost judgments that I had reserved. During the trial, in relating to the trial, I had to issue five formal rulings. Uh, 41 bench notes and five judgments, and immediately prior to it, three judgments and six minutes. There is more than enough work for high court judges. But the nature of it is different uh, from that in practice, even though you're dealing with court cases in both roles. Again, I should emphasize these are my views only. I know different judges have different experiences of workload. But personally, I have felt the pressure of time to be appreciably less at the bench than at the bar, which is probably what you want. Uh, I feel I've had the ability to take more time to get my judgments right, or as right as they're going to be. A colleague of mine likens the role to being on a conveyor belt, where one case after another inexorably presents itself as an opportunity to trip or fall behind. Uh, and to sustain a period of short cause hearings can lead to that feeling. Uh, but so far, with the advantage of a big common room in Auckland, around which work is spread, I found it manageable, more manageable uh, than in practice, and more manageable than life as being here. <laughs> and certainly there is a conventional view of academic life as contemplative, laid back, relaxed. The pressures of teaching and research in New Zealand universities today are, in my view, just as great as they often are in the practice of law or on the bench. No doubt, uh, much pressure in all of those roles was self-generated, particularly by those with an A-type personality. And there are more opportunities, indeed expectations, the tells me, of attendance at overseas conferences in academia. But those in practice should not assume that the pressure of work on an academic who must teach young minds, mark hundreds of assignments and tests, research in depth and write scholarship that contributes original knowledge to the world, necessarily reflects the far lower pay rates they receive. Finally, while I'm on such comparisons, I should also say that neither the judiciary nor private practice nor academic life contained a level of pressure on time that I experienced in the public service, either as a policy manager as Deputy Secretary for Justice uh, or as a legal manager as Deputy Solicitor General. At the bar, you feel responsible for a client's case. Strangely enough, I have a different sense now of the extent to which counsel contribute to the outcome of a case than I did when I was at the bar. <laughs> And perhaps, not as strangely, I feel a greater sense of responsibility for that outcome now. 
I do think there is more pressure of responsibility on a judge than on an academic or a practitioner. While failing students matters or clients, there's nothing equivalent in academic life to the sense of responsibility you have as a judge in sentencing someone to a lengthy term of imprisonment. It weighs on you. I did feel a similar pressure at times, similar pressure of responsibility as a public servant, whether at Crown Law, the Ministry of Justice, or the Treasury. But that was responsibility at a different level. Responsibility for advice rather than decisions, usually, as at the bar. And also responsibility for broad effects of policies and the wider interests of the Crown and the public of New Zealand. I feel that as a judge too, especially in making decisions or overturn observations about the law that have presidential significance, but there are only a few occasions as a public servant that I felt the sort of concentrated responsibility of affecting the life of an individual to the extent I do as a judge. When I moved from policy advice and then academia to litigation, I thought appearing in court was a bit like a combination of advising a minister and teaching. It had the public performance aspect uh, of teaching targeted an individual or a small group of judges. Having now jumped the bench, uh, I have a different view of who is analogous to the lecturer. I've experienced far less performance anxiety on the bench than at the bar during the hearing of the case, and rather like the difference between being a lecturer and a student in a class of Socratic dialogue. I can confirm my friend David Goddard's suspicion that while barristers have to enjoy talking, judges have to enjoy listening. Perhaps presiding in court is a combination, or like a combination, of teaching and chairing a meeting, particularly a faculty meeting. There's still the public performance aspect. And in each setting, you need a degree of persuasive authority to keep order. You can find yourself dealing with difficult students, faculty members, counsel, or litigants in person. You have to read the materials, think about the issues, be ready to engage with counsel, faculty, or students, particularly in a Socratic dialogue. The point of engagement is different in each role. As a judge, the oral hearing is an opportunity to inform yourself about the issues and the evidence and the law and the arguments in order to give the parties a fair hearing and improve the ultimate quality of your judgment. Although it may have the effect of helping counsel understand their cases better as well, and the nature of advocacy and law in general. As a lecturer, the lecture is an opportunity to inform the students about the specific and the general aspects of the law, often through questions, at least at this law school, as well as to teach them to think like a lawyer. I haven't yet seen an equivalent to the practice of some lecturers at Victoria walking out of class if enough students randomly called on have not prepared. Some counsel that is tempting, <laughs> but would not be fair to their clients. The litigants in person, I expect it might engender a similar reaction to that experienced by one lecturer at Victoria, who I will not name as Alberto here, <laughs> uh, when I was dean, with, with an hour, within an hour of the lecturer, the anonymous lecturer walking out, I received a phone call from the Dominion Post after students had complained. Like some students, a few counsel and most litigants in person are ill-equipped to make legal arguments, usually in inverse proportion to their own confidence that they are. Uh, as I said in a recent judgment in relation to litigants in person, there is a fine line to be walked. And 16% of my cases, usually civil, have involved litigants in person. I note for the benefit of Victoria Law students, who are here, that Socratic dialogue does teach you how to perform as counsel appearing in court. It has all the same aspects, lack of time to prepare, the terror of not knowing what questions will be asked, the power imbalance, and the huge buzz after an effective interaction. I consider the most effective, gentle Socratic dialogue that I have conducted to have been not in a classroom, 
uh, but in a criminal sentence appeal in a courtroom in Hamilton, which resulted in Crown consent to turn it into a conviction appeal as well, which was ultimately successful. In my view, the role of judges is not only similar to that of lecturer in terms of court or classroom appearances, but also in the primary, other primary aspect of each role. After a hearing or lecture, you wander back to your chambers or office to write. The nature of what you write is different. Each job, in essence, appear, involves appearing in public and writing in private, as does that of the barrister. One of the most significant differences between writing of academics, legal academics, and judges, and between lawyers and judges, is the judge is required to make decisions. You cannot end your judgment with a plea for other scholars to research and clarify the area of law. You cannot end by reference to one hand and the other. You cannot give a percentage chance of success. You must decide, and the reasons for your decision will be public. In the Auckland launch of the Feminist Judgments of Aotearoa book last week, uh, Professor Janet McLean noted that as a primary point of distinction compared with academic work. I concur, though there is not nearly as much difference in that between judges and the law officers of the Crown, who often also make authoritative decisions. Incidentally, I note uh, for judges, uh, I'll pass this on to those who are here uh, later, uh, that what they say in judgments matters in the academy, or it can matter, it provides more fodder for academic discourse, um, which demonstrates that their work is of value in the real world, so-called. Uh, and I personally think it's useful for judgments to stimulate agreement and disagreement with good quality and relevant academic commentary, where the judge is aware of it and has time to do so, I try to make a practice of that. In fact, I'm happiest uh, when I write a judgment that does three things simultaneously. Resolves the dispute between the parties, develops the law, and contributes to academic debates about what the law is and how it should be developed. There are a lot more opportunities to do that than I expected. Judgments are usually shorter than academic articles and are certainly shorter than books, so many are longer than they need to be. I was struck by the observation of one of my uh, fellow judges who found writing judgments diametrically different to writing opinions for clients and practice. Instead of writing with a slant or angle oriented to the client, a judgment is written on a neutral basis in the public interest based on what the judge thinks the law is and how it applies to the facts. What struck me was not that distinction, but the fact that I see almost no difference between the voice in which I write judgments and articles. A judge and an academic both write in their own voices about what they understand the law to be and what they think it should be. And I have found the academic experience of writing a doctoral dissertation and books, with all the work involved in striving for structure and coherence and clarity, to be immensely useful in writing longer judgments, the longest of which is so far as 194 paragraphs. Matters of fact are much harder to decide than law. The facts of a case are served up to you by witnesses and documents. Sometimes they're not enough for you to be sure of what happened but you still have to make a decision about them. When in doubt, I've found so far that the best approach is to be very transparent about the limits and limitations of the material before you, what you think about them, and why. The law is much easier. You can retire to your chambers to think about it, unless it's a jury trial, and you can get your clerk to do more research, although significant additional research needs to be put to counsel, obviously. I've been blessed with uh, particularly uh, useful and valuable clerks, uh, Stephen Lang for a few months, Yasmin Olson, uh, and now Jessica Story. Most High Court judges share uh, one clerk between two judges and have a full associate. I've reversed that ratio uh, and am very happy with that arrangement. I treat a clerk pretty much as I did a research assistant at the university, uh, seeking research memoranda about aspects of the law, issue spotting and upcoming cases, fact checking as well as proofing and also as a sounding board. 
is another debt that my judging has to academia. Judge Posner complained bitterly in his book about the US practice of law clerks doing the first drafts of judgments. I agree. I consider committing my reasoning to writing constitutes my judgment and determines the result. Reasons and reasoning seems to me to be the most distinctive aspect of the whole of the judicial enterprise compared with the other two branches of government. The judiciary is required to reason and to make public that reasoning in applying the facts, the law to the facts. So I am appointed to reason. My clerk is not. And it seems that that is no longer thought to be the case in the United States appellate courts. I do not understand that to be the position in New Zealand, and it should not be. Oral judgments are still delivered in New Zealand. Uh, many judgments, including me, deliver oral judgments for bail and sentence appeals and sometimes other matters as well. That accounts for 29% of my judgments. But the majority of judgments are reserved and written. And I think the mode of delivery matters. There's something about pinning down inchoate thoughts in writing that requires them to be more precisely formulated. I don't like the expression reduced to writing. For this reason, I prefer committed to writing. Committing your views to writing commits you to a certain path of logic and reasoning. And if you get stuck, you can retrace your steps to see you went, where you went wrong, which is not as easy as an oral judgment. Furthermore, my observation uh, is that the mode by which thoughts are committed to writing matters. Dictating preserves much of the tone and style of orality. I also think it makes for more discursive language and more words. I was taught to touch type at secondary school in the United States, uh, and so since the advent of the personal computer in the 1980s, uh, I've always written by typing on screen, I think, on screen. Uh, and I hope that's useful for my writing, but I actually can't do anything else now. My most uh, important observation about the process of writing judgments is that it matters. My experience is that the need to explain your reasoning is a very real constraint on the discretion of judges. I had always been skeptical about whether judges decide the result and write the reasoning later to fit. Early on as a judge, I got into the habit of writing a summary paragraph, or sometimes two, immediately after the hearing. Usually there's a gap of several weeks uh, between a hearing and when you can start writing a judgment because of the accumulated backlog. But within a month of starting as a judge, I found my reasoning could change the result I thought I favored. A fact or an aspect of law I had not appreciated the hearing can make its presence felt when explaining the reason in writing, which does explain sometimes with counsel why the hearing goes slightly different than the judgment. And it can change the result you thought you were going to come to. I've adopted the practice of including my summary at the beginning of every written judgment. Every written judgment, more than 10 paragraphs. Uh, this is probably influenced by the practice that I've always liked uh, in academia of journals requiring abstracts at the beginning of academic articles they publish, so you can tell whether it's worth reading them. <laughs> as well as the need to summarize advice uh, for ministers. I'm in the minority in doing this uh, in New Zealand. There are only two other high court judges who routinely put the result up front. But a judgment, in my view, is not a mystery novel. A reader of a written judgment knows the result has already been determined and usually flicks to the end to find out what it is. They want to know what the result is and the reasons for it, and encapsulating both of those things up front uh, in a summary is just that front. And if I don't summarize it, someone else will. I'd rather do it myself as part of the judgment. I think it improves the accessibility of the judgment and therefore the law to the reader and therefore enhances the rule of law. And a realist committed to candor can hardly do anything else. The second most significant uh, difference between legal academics and judges, in my view, is that academics are specialists and judges are generalists. Judge Posner makes this point about the United States, and it's true here. 
Academics are now advised to specialise at a relatively early stage in their careers, ideally in areas they teach in as well. By the time they become senior academics, they have sometimes broadened out, usually by broadening their areas of specialty, and John Burroughs is worth uh, mentioning in that regard as a national tolerant, a standout example, as a primary author of a standard text on interpretation, on a co-author of texts on contract law and talk law and media law. Judges in the senior courts must all deal with all legal disputes which come their way in whatever area of law. My greatest satisfaction in academic work lay in the opportunity to become more expert in the depths of a particular area of law. My greatest satisfaction in judicial work so far is to gain some understanding of the patterns across broad swathes of law. Doing that promotes consistency and coherence in the application of legal principle across all areas of law, the body of law. The profession is a choice, uh, but I do consider uh, and hesitantly submit uh, that over-specialisation in some areas of the profession, and the tax bar and resource management bar spring to mind, uh, has had negative effects on the nature of perceptions of law in those areas and, and specialist adjudication in those fields. Generalism must, however, mean, especially when relatively new, that judges are dealing with areas of law they do not uh, fully appreciate all the ins and outs of. In the 16 judgments I delivered in my first three months of being a judge, I had previously come across the relevant law in only one. That one, in which I considered I had some expertise, was the only one that was appealed. <laughs> and of course, I turned. <laughs> both by the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, <laughs> though the score was five to four if you count all the judges in <laughs> The decisions of all judges are subject to appeal unless you're a Supreme Court judge who is always right, because they're final. My reaction to being appealed is not what I thought it would be. Before I was appointed, I regarded with scepticism the claim that judges didn't mind being overturned. But one reason why there is less minding than you might think is because by the time the appellate judgment comes out, you struggle to remember the detail of what you had held or to muster the energy to go back and compare the two. The judge is always aware any decision can be appealed, or almost any. You expect some judgments to be appealed, especially in criminal law or in novel areas of law. And if you make a mistake, then you want that mistake to be corrected on appeal particularly when you're dealing with a far-reaching decision affecting people's personal liberty. My own reactions to the two appeals so far that have overturned my decisions have been that I haven't minded the end result changing in either. I regarded the final appellate decision in each case as entirely reasonable. In fact, I liked the outcome of one of them better than I liked my own, which is slightly disconcerting. But I have felt minor irritation at a statement in one of the appeal judgments that I won't name, that I felt mischaracterized a very minor part of the reasoning of my judgment. I still think there is usually an effect on the ego of being overturned, but it is less than I thought. The extent probably differs from judge to judge. But the existence of any effect, I think, is a reason why there are issues of principle with the commonplace practice in New Zealand of judges deciding to, whether to grant leave to appeal from their own decisions in certain sorts of cases. There is a safety valve in the Court of Appeal being able to have a second look at such applications. And there are good practical reasons of efficiency supporting that practice, and my view is in the minority. But in terms of the long-term legitimacy of the judiciary, I don't much like the risk that a judge deciding whether there should be an appeal from his or her, her own judgment would be perceived to be a judge in their own cause. A judge's judgment is not his or her own cause, of course, but I doubt that distinction will be widely appreciated by many litigants or lay observers. I make one final observation about a common cultural attitude, common cultural attitude of the legal academy, judiciary, and profession. They are all jealous of their independence which has legal protection in each case. 
In my experience is that all three groups, all those three groups of lawyers, the judiciary, the academy, the profession, feel their independence keenly, keenly. They will assert it when they consider they need to. And that is how it should be. But it does have a consequence with which some people here will be familiar. None of these groups of lawyers or former lawyers, much like management or being managed. <laughs> that may be a cultural attitude of lawyers generally. I share it. The often used metaphor of herding cats springs to mind. I've managed three groups of around 40 lawyers, policy advisors in the Ministry of Justice, legal academics at Victoria, and legal advisors at Crown Law. I'm now a member of a group of 46 former lawyers on the High Court bench. The similarities between all of those groups, collective attitudes to management, vastly outweigh their differences. <laughs> it's difficult to tell whether academics or judges are more resistant. In this regard, uh, I will draw to the academics' attention who are here. Um, Minerva Cheevey's 2011 blog on advanced faculty wrangling with an extended analogy of the cat metaphor. Actually, at a big picture level, I think resistance is often justified and not always futile, though it can manifest in unfortunate ways. The consequence can be significant tensions between faculty members and university management, it's certainly the case in Auckland at the moment, and between judges and the Ministry of Justice. But both of those topics are for an entirely different lecture. I should say, however, what a supportive environment I have found the High Auckland High Court Common Room to be. It collectively welcomes new arrivals and supports you on an ongoing basis, as does what is known as the wider judicial family. One final point. We've got time for that. I want to note one dimension of the academic role which I suggest academics could do better at, and which judges can learn from. Section 162 of the Education Act, with which Sir Kenneth Keith will be familiar, uh, follows the section which preserves academic freedom and itemises five characteristics possessed by all universities. One is to be a critic and conscience of society. When I was Dean of Law here, I was often contacted to comment by media on issues of the law. I would try to do so, as long as I felt well enough informed about it. Sometimes, if I was too busy or conflicted, uh, I would not, and on some of those occasions, the story just wouldn't run. I suggest that the Legal Academy in New Zealand uh, does not make their expert views available enough to New Zealand society. There are a number who do, and Dean Knight here is a paradigmatic example. Uh, but many legal academics, somewhat surprisingly, perhaps shun public exposure and prefer to keep modestly to themselves, teaching, researching, and staking out positions in academic publications, which is understandable, but that is not enough. Participation in mainstream social media is vital to ensure New Zealand has a robust and informed civil society, particularly in the age of post-truth politics, fake news, alternative facts, and what seems to be an international trend towards illiberalism. We need critics and consciences to speak up. <coughs> Perhaps some of the topics I've addressed today could be one more subject since it lacks a rigorous theoretical framework. And perhaps judges need to think about whether that is a similarity or a difference with their role. Judges do and must speak authoritatively about law through their judgments. Only occasionally do New Zealand judges speak extrajudicially. No speeches or public lectures by judges are posted on the courts of New Zealand website for 2018. Eight were posted from 2017, 10 from 2016, 20 from 2015. Of 38 speeches in four years, three judges gave all but six of them. The Chief Justice, Justice Glasbrook, and now President Koch. I gave two. There is room for more. I'm not saying judges should publicly advocate policy or political positions. They clearly should not. But greater public understanding and support of the judicial role and discussion ought to enhance support for the rule of law, which is and ought to be a constitutional norm in New Zealand. 
I believe extrajudicial stimulation can do that as I have tried to do today. No, 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 no,